Good evening. I'm Joel Woodruff, president of the C.S. Lewis Institute, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the CSLI live stream event with Dr. Carl Truman, Obsession with Self-Identity, Sexuality, and the Rewriting of History. How did we get where we are today? If this is your first uh, CSLI live stream event, I encourage you to uh, click the chat room button at the bottom of your screen, and there you can find links uh, to our website and to various CS CSLI resources. We have a free digital subscription and encourage you to subscribe to our monthly and quarterly publications, and as well to get news about events like this. Uh, in fact, we have an event coming up in November with Dr. Daryl Bach that I think you'll be excited uh, to uh, view as well. Uh, the C.S. Lewis Institute was founded 45 years ago as a servant ministry to the church for the purpose of developing wholehearted disciples of Jesus Christ who articulate, defend, share, and live their faith in personal and public life. The Institute now has 17 locations in the United States, Canada, and Northern Ireland, and we run a number of discipleship programs, events, and people from around the world come to our website to use our small group resources, uh, read our articles, and, and to use our audio and video resources. So I encourage you to take advantage of, of that wonderful resource as well. Uh, today, we're grateful to be using Zoom webinar for the event. And uh, it, the great thing about this is that you can be anywhere in the world and, and take, uh, take advantage of this wonderful opportunity to hear Dr. Truman tonight. Uh, this evening, we'll, uh, have, we have opened up the Q&A room. And so at the bottom of your screen, if you click that Q&A button, you'll be able to submit questions or make comments throughout the evening. We'll be collecting questions uh, during uh, Dr. Truman's presentation. And then following his presentation, we'll have a time to ask questions. Uh, we'll do our best to answer as many of those questions as we can. Uh, and we may sometimes uh, combine questions, but we're looking forward to that Q&A time as well. And so I encourage you to send in your questions uh, throughout the evening. Uh, please join me in prayer as we uh, begin this evening. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to have this uh, evening with Dr. Truman as we explore uh, what is happening in our culture, not only today, but what has happened in the past several hundred years and how we got where we are today. We pray that you would guide and direct our time. And at the end of the evening, I pray that all of us uh, would be uh, uh, better, uh, uh, more knowledgeable, have a better understanding of the culture and be inspired to stand and live uh, for you, Lord Jesus, and your truth in deeper, more meaningful ways in our world today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's uh, my pleasure tonight to introduce our theme and the speaker. As I've um, talked with disciples of Jesus Christ throughout the country over the past um, uh, year, it's been uh, amazing just to see how many people are shocked at the rapidity of change in our culture today and how many of the Judeo-Christian foundations of our culture have uh, dissipated and seem to have been relegated uh, to, uh, to the past. Uh, for example, the concept that there are uh, two genders, male and female, uh, now, as uh, 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 many people believe to be at an antiquated idea, in fact, on Facebook, I think there are at least 58 different genders, and some people argue we should have 71 gender choices. The idea of marriage being uh, between a man and a woman is something that now many people see as limiting, and so there are many and multiple options for uh, marriage uh, unions. Uh, we also a lot see, I think, in our culture today, a lack of civility, the idea that we can have uh, public discourse and ideas and agree to disagree in a thoughtful, gracious way. Uh, instead, the uh, cancel culture seems to have jumped out and taken us by surprise. And in fact, the cancel culture as well has seemed to impact our view of history, as many of the great heroes of, of history, even of American history, uh, have been taken down. In a sense, at least their statues and names have been taken down from buildings. People like Abraham Lincoln, who uh, many uh, around the world have revered for his fight against the evil of slavery, or George Mason, who wrote the Virginia Bill of Rights, or Thomas Jefferson, who wrote the Declaration of Independence, stating that all men are created equal. Uh, these figures in history are now seen to be uh, people of the past who, who don't have much to offer our world today. Um, I think that um, uh, many of us are asking this question, how did we get where we are today in such a quick and short amount of time. Well, this evening, uh, Dr. Carl Truman is going to give us a little different perspective on how we got here today. Um, and we're looking forward to hearing from him. Dr. Truman 
is really one of the leading uh, experts on culture and, and analyzing history and how and and our modern world. Uh, and it wrote a, a book that's been a, just a, a wonderful bestseller and has had come with rave reviews. It's this book here, The Rise of the Modern Self. I encourage you to, to pick up a copy uh, if you can. Dr. Bruce Ashford uh, has said this about this book. It says, Truman's book is perhaps the most significant analysis and evaluation of Western culture written by a Protestant during the past 50 years. And Dr. John Wiley writes, we cannot respond appropriately to our times unless we understand how and why our times are defined such as they are. Carl Truman offers us this necessary book, which is a great gift to us in our continuing struggle to live in the world, but not be of the world. Dr. Truman is a professor of biblical religious studies at Grove City College. He has an MA from Cambridge University, PhD from the University of Aberdeen. Uh, he's an esteemed church historian and uh, previously served as the William E. Simon Fellow in Religion and Public Life at Princeton University. Uh, Truman has offered over a dozen books, and we're just so grateful to have Dr. Carl Truman with us today. Carl, thank you for joining us this evening. Well, it's a great pleasure to be with you, Joel, and for everybody else who's online. Uh, and thanks for that lovely introduction. Um, Bruce Ashford is not a code name for my mother, I have to stress. <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> but, uh, <clears throat> No, it's a great pleasure to be with you all this evening. And uh, as Joel has uh, articulated in his introductory comments, we live in a time of tremendous flux, chaos and change. And I think it is part of that reality uh, is such that we, we cannot simply reduce its cause to one or two things. Uh, the reason the why the world is in the state it's in at the moment uh, is the result of a, of a variety, a vast number of different factors. And it's impossible for me this evening, in a mere 45 minutes, to try to deal with everything that has fed into the current climate of change, flux, and anxiety that we now find ourselves in. Uh, what I want to do, though, is pull out some of what I consider to be the most salient points and hopefully give you some ideas for exploring our current cultural moment yourselves. At the heart of our modern problem, or our contemporary problem, I think, lies a way of imagining ourselves to be. What has occurred, I think, in the West in the last two, three hundred years is a new notion of the way we conceive of ourselves as human beings, as human persons, has come to dominate the popular, the cultural imagination. And the dramatic changes we see taking place in society around us at the moment are uh, given a coherence, if you like, or given unity by being functions of or symptomatic of that underlying fundamental change. And I want to talk about that this evening and then point to a number of ways in which that change has altered, for example, our understanding of institutions and our understanding of history and our understanding of some of the traditional rights that have up until fairly recently been considered obvious social goods and yet have in recent years been transformed into, into things that are regarded as part of the problem, not part of the solution. So I want to tell the story of the modern self and then I want to work out the implications of that within the broader uh, parameters of our culture. If I could summarize uh, the, the view of the modern self that I want to look at, that I want to trace this evening, uh, I would use the term expressive individualism. Expressive individualism is a term coined, I think, by Robert Bella, the American sociologist, in the 1990s in his great book, Habits of the Heart. And Bella defined expressive individualism. He defined the, the modern self in the following terms. Expressive individualism holds that each person has a unique core of feeling and intuition that should unfold or be expressed if individuality is to be realized. What Bell is saying there is that the way we think about ourselves in modern society, the normative notion of the self, is one where our inner feelings are critical to our identity, critical to who we are. And our ability to express those inner feelings is therefore essential 
to what we might dub as social authenticity. You might say, well, uh, isn't that rather obvious? I would respond, well, it is today, but of course that has not been the way that people have always thought about themselves. Use an example. I use this example in, in my book. Uh, I draw a contrast between myself and my grandfather. And I say, you know, if you'd ask my grandfather, who was a, he was a working class factory man, union, union member from the industrial heartland, the Midlands of England. If you'd ask my grandfather if as a sheet metal worker, he'd had job satisfaction. I think, first of all, he'd be confused by the question. The very idea of job satisfaction, as we can understand it in our contemporary world, would have been an alien concept to him. But if we'd explained to him, do, do you find your work worthwhile? I think his answer would have run along these kind of lines. Yeah, I, I find my work worthwhile because I get paid a fair day's wage for an honest day's work. I'm able to put shoes on my children's feet and uh, bread, meat and potatoes, on the family table. I'm able to meet my obligations to other people. Now, if you ask me the same question, Truman, do you get job satisfaction? I'm intuitively going to respond in a, in a somewhat different way. I'm likely to respond and say, yeah, I, I find teaching young people great. I love it when I'm in class and there's some back and forth. When I'm trying to explain a complicated idea, suddenly I see light bulbs going on in uh, students' eyes as something they've not understood before becomes clear to them. Notice the difference in our two answers there. My grandfather's answer is very much connected to the obligations, the relationships of obligation that he has to other people. My answer is really grounded in the psychological satisfaction, the feeling that I get from doing the work I do. I might return now to the point I started the lecture with and say, I'm an expressive individual. It's my inner core of feelings that are the most important thing about me in a way that my grandfather was not. How he felt about his work, if that counted at all, only counted to the extent that it connected to the external obligations that he fulfilled to other people. My grandfather was who he was because he had a relationship of responsibility towards others. I am who I am because I feel in a certain way. Now, when you think about that in terms of our contemporary social uh, context, uh, it has some fairly dramatic and extreme forms. Think of the trans moment which we're facing. When somebody says, I'm a woman trapped in a man's body, uh, that would have been regarded by my grandfather, I think, as, as complete nonsense just 25, 30 years ago. But now, of course... Not only is it commonly accepted, it's, it's moving into the realms of a political and social orthodoxy to which one must conform, with which one must agree in order to be a member of civil society. But think about it. I'm a woman trapped in a man's body, prioritizes inner feelings and the ability to express those inner feelings outwardly as lying at the heart of what it means to be an authentic person. Perhaps in a less extreme example, we could think about uh, people describing themselves as I'm lesbian, or I'm gay, I'm bi, or I'm straight. Think about that. Those are identities rooted in desire, in inner desires. They're not even rooted in action or activity. Uh, the parent whose child comes to them and says, Dad, I, I think I'm gay, knows that the child may not be making a statement about any sexual activity in which they've engaged, but is making a statement really about the inner desire they feel. That we routinely now identify ourselves by our sexual desires, again, points to the importance, the priority we now place on inner feelings which Robert Bella points to in his definition of expressive individualism. And the question is, how has this come about? And what are the implications of it? Well, for it to have come about, two things must have occurred within the way we imagine ourselves to be. Two things need to have occurred within, we might say, the social or cultural imagination of a society for these things to be plausible. First, feelings and desires have to become more important than bodies. 
Again, we can uh, give an example of how that has become the case today when, uh, say, 50 or 100 years ago, somebody had gone to a doctor and had used that phrase, I'm a woman trapped in a man's body. The doctor would probably have said, well, that's a problem. It's a problem with your mind. We need to treat your mind in order to bring it into conformity with your body. The doctor is operating in a world where the body has an authority over the feelings at that point. If you go to your doctor today, your doctor may actually be legally obliged to identify the problem as a problem of the body, not the mind. So we see in, in that scenario exactly that kind of displacement of external physical authority with psychological authority that must have taken place for expressive individualism to become the dominant form of thinking about ourselves today. Secondly, particularly, I think, in terms of uh, the descriptors uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, straight, sexual desire has to have become decisive for identity. So the story we need to trace is one whereby we need to look at how is it that external markers, bodies, relations of obligation and dependency, etc., things that have typically identified us, have come to have less authority than our inner feelings. And we need to also to understand how those inner feelings have come to be identified with sexual desire. Well, the first, the first step, I think, is what we might call the inward turn. Again, go back to the Middle Ages. If I'd asked, if you were living in the Middle Ages, and I'd say, who are you? You would have identified yourself in terms of external relations. I'm a peasant farmer. I'm the son or daughter of so-and-so. I live in such and such a place. Uh, I belong to such and such a clan. You would have identified yourself. Your sense of self would have come from external realities. That all begins to shift for various reasons, really in the 16th century with the Reformation, uh, the emphasis upon justification by faith, for example, uh, placing an emphasis upon the individual's responsibility to believe, uh, the growth of cities and the, the breaking down of the old patterns of social organization mean that those external markers are being destabilized. There are all kinds of things going on in the 16th century that serve to, to weaken the externals of identity and to start pushing things towards the inside. This gets turbocharged, I think, in the 18th century, particularly in the thought of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, interesting self-taught genius Genevan philosopher. Uh, Rousseau is the man who famously declared that man is born free, but everywhere is in chains. What Rousseau does is, is argue sort of, I suppose, in his day, it would have been counterintuitively, uh, argue that it's culture that messes people up, that we are born in a relatively pristine state. It's as we enter into society, as we form relationships with other people, that we become corrupted. We have to start performing in certain ways to be accepted by society. We become envious and jealous of each other. We start to compete. We start to suppress our inner feelings in order to get on and belong. Rousseau is the, the great sort of theorist of that. And Rousseau's thinking receives a remarkable and plausible uh, artistic and cultural expression in the work of the Romantics. Romanticism is uh, an artistic movement really beginning around about the middle of the 18th century with uh, a figure such as the Scottish poet Robert Burns and flourishing in the latter part of the 18th, early 19th centuries, associated with uh, figures such as uh, uh, Schiller on the continent, Hölderlin, uh, um, Coleridge, Wordsworth, Percy Bysshe Shelley, William Blake. Romanticism was a movement that, that placed great emphasis upon that inner space and inner feelings as defining the real us. Feelings become constitutive of authenticity. And society, society broadly considered, society even considered in terms of one-on-one -on -one relations with others, is always therefore first and foremost a threat to authenticity demanding that we perform in certain ways that do not reflect that which we feel inwardly. 
a good example of, of, of the sort of what we might call almost the late romantic sensibility can be found in Bruce Jenner's uh, interview with Diane Sawyer in 2015 uh, on, for 60 Minutes. You can find a transcription of it online. Uh, what's very interesting about that interview is the language that Jenner uses about finally being able to be himself, herself, finally being able to be the person they always have been but of having to play a role because society has forced him to do so. That's very much in line with the sort of Rousseau romantic trajectory that sees authenticity as lying in the inner self. The self, if you like, with Rousseau and the romantics becomes psychologized. The self becomes that inner psychological space. And that immediately means that external social structures and relationships become problematized. Think of that statement, man is born free and everywhere is in chains. What Rousseau is really saying there is that the, the relationships we have could all actually be links in a chain that binds us. I think it's no coincidence that Rousseau sends all five of his children to an orphanage shortly after birth, almost certainly a death sentence in the 18th century. Uh, Rousseau does that, of course, because what are children? Children are restrictions on his freedom. Children are things that infringe on his ability to be himself. Again, there's a fairly direct line between that way of thinking and uh, kind of pro-choice advocacy that one finds in the public square today when what is the child in the womb but an alien invader preventing somebody from achieving their full human potential stands on a line very much with Rousseau. Moving forward, though, we've got that inward turn then. The, the next key move, I think, is the sexualizing of that inner space. And here the key figure is Sigmund Freud. Freud's not unique, but he's, I think, the most influential and the most brilliant of the psychoanalysts emerging in the late 19th, early 20th century, particularly out of Austria, out of Vienna. Uh, Freud... Uh, is in many ways influenced, I think, by Romanticism. He was uh, very interested in Jean-Jacques Rousseau, for example. But whereas Rousseau sees that inner space, that inner psychological self as being pristine, Freud does not. For Rousseau, for example, the, the unspoiled human being would not really need law because law is only necessary once we become kind of twisted by society. If I'm Rousseau's noble savage, the, the man untouched by the corruptions of society, walking across the plains and I see another human being suffering, say being beaten up or attacked, my natural instincts will be to go and help them because I will feel an immediate empathy. I don't need an external law telling me to help the one in trouble. The cry of nature of our common humanity will be enough to do that. But Freud, and I think Freud more accurately sees that that inner space that Rousseau has identified as being so important for who we are is not a blithe and happy place. It's a dark and destructive place where the romantics saw the inner self as a sort of idyllic area. Freud sees it as dark and sinister, characterized by violent sexual desires. And Freud goes further than that. He extends this back to childhood. Uh, in his three essays on sexuality, he uh, articulates a taxonomy of human development, whereby every stage in human development, from infancy to the grave, can be understood in terms of the nature of our sexual desires. Notice what he's doing there. He's doing more than just darkening the inner space at that point. He's also making sexual desire part of the core, if not the core, of what it is to be a human being. With Freud, if you like, sex becomes something you are, not something you do. I uh, had a fascinating piece of hate mail this afternoon from a 
uh, what, what I would describe as a queer revolutionary socialist, uh, lambasting me for my ignorance about this, that, and the other. And one of the things that, uh, that this person was, was stressing was that there have been gay and queer people throughout history. Well, I would dispute that. I would say there's been homosexual sex throughout history, most certainly. But to say that there have been people who've identified as homosexuals throughout history is a very different thing. Certainly wasn't the case in ancient Greece, where there was a lot of homosexual activity. But the idea of identifying as a gay person, identifying oneself in terms of one's sexual desires, was really not part of the Greek experience at all. It's really with Freud that that becomes plausible. You know, and if you define yourself as lesbian, gay, bi, or straight, then you are conceding the Freudian point that you are identified, that your identity is grounded in your sexual desire. And that brings us to the third step in this sort of process. And this is perhaps the most sinister one. Once sex has been turned into identity, it's inevitable that sex will become highly political. Because if you think about it, at the heart of most society's moral codes are sets of restrictions on sexual activity. You can look from society to society, they're not always the same, but every civilization has rules about what is and is not legitimate sexual behavior. Once sex becomes identity, then those rules are transformed, not simply into restrictions on behavior, but restrictions on identity. Those laws effectively define who is a legitimate person and who is not once you take sex as being a matter of identity. So once sex becomes identity, it's inevitable that it's going to be politicized. Once, if you like, expressive individualism is the self, and once the self is sexualized, there's going to be a sexual revolution. And I should perhaps pause here and define what I mean by sexual revolution. Uh, a lot of Christians, a lot of conservative, you don't have to be a Christian, a lot of conservative people think that the sexual revolution is all about the expansion of the range of legitimate sexual behaviors. Whereas once upon a time, adultery was frowned upon. Now it isn't frowned upon so much. Whereas once upon a time, gay sex was frowned upon. Now it isn't frowned upon. It's joined the canon of things that one is allowed to do. One is allowed to get away with in society. That's to underestimate what the sexual revolution does. What the sexual revelation, revolution actually does is transform the nature and function of sex in its entirety. Under what we might call the old regime, sexual acts had an intrinsic moral quality to them. Some sexual acts were legitimate, they were moral. Some were considered intrinsically immoral. Sex with one's spouse, moral. Sex with somebody else's spouse, intrinsically immoral. Now, when you think about sexual morality, of course, we're in a very different world. Essentially, the core of sexual morality today, that which makes an act moral or immoral, is the issue of consent. Are all the people involved consenting to what is going on? If so, it's moral. If not, then it's immoral. But think about that. That's what the sexual revolution has done. It hasn't simply expanded the amount of sexual activities one can engage in legitimately. It's changed the very nature and significance of sexual activity. Think of modesty as another example to draw another aspect of the sexual revolution. Uh, when I first became a Christian in the 1980s, in the churches I attended, there'd be occasional debates about modesty. Sorry to the women listening. It's, it was a sexist old world, and modesty debates tended to focus on women's clothing. How short could a skirt be? Uh, were one-piece bathing suits legitimate? Were two-piece bathing suits legitimate? Those kind of things. What was interesting about those debates, though, was that everybody involved typically had a concept of modesty. They regarded modesty as a good thing and then debated where the limits lay. We don't debate modesty anymore because modesty itself is an inherently ridiculous concept. As soon as you start talking about modesty today, you sound 
oppressive. You sound pharisaical. One cannot debate modesty anymore in the public square because modesty has become inherently ridiculous, inherently repressive, precisely because of the transformation in the way we understand sexual activity to function or sexual desire to function relative to our identities. So that's the intellectual genealogy then, the inward turn, the sexualizing of that inward turn, and then the politicizing of that inward turn. But very few people read Rousseau. Very few of the people who now accept that the statement, I'm a woman trapped in a man's body, have read Judith Butler, or very much in queer or gender theory. Very few people have read that. So how come these ideas have become so plausible to what we might call the ordinary man or woman in the street? Well, in order to understand that, I think we have to cast our net more broadly. And we have to understand that most of us think the way we do about most things, not because we've read books or been persuaded by arguments, but because our tuition, intuitions have been shaped or tuned in a certain way by the very environment in which we live. We, if you like, have have subconsciously imbibed ways of imagining the world to be. One of the, the biggest factors in this is technology. Technology, I think, more than anything else, has shaped the way we think the world is, mediates the world to us, if you like. Think about how technology has... <clears throat> transformed space, uh, geography. I'm an immigrant. My accent gives it away that I wasn't born in New Jersey. I wasn't born and brought up in Camden. I grew up in the United Kingdom. I emigrated some 20 years ago. Uh, were I tonight to decide that I wanted to go and see my mother, I could be with her on Saturday morning. I could buy a ticket, Obviously, I'd probably have to have a COVID test today. There'd be a little bit of extra time added for that. Then I'd catch a plane tomorrow night and I'd be with my mother on Saturday morning, her time, less than 48 hours. 200 years ago, if I'd emigrated, I'd have left my loved ones on the quay in Bristol, knowing that I would almost certainly never see them again. Technology's transformed the way we Imagine the world, imagine the possibilities of this world. It's changed the way we experience church. No longer do we go to the church that's closest to us typically. We choose our church because we can drive a distance and get there. Think about that. If you've been going to church in the Middle Ages, the only church, the only show in town would have been the only church in town. Now, nobody thinks about the church that way, not even my Catholic friends who are supposed to worship in the parish where they live necessarily think that way. They will travel for a Latin mass or something like this. The way we think about space has been transformed by technology. We might also say that the way we've been taught to think about our relationship to nature and the world has been shaped by technology. Technology has taught us to believe that we can control things. We are able to manipulate the environment in a way that was never possible before. If you'd grown up in the Middle Ages, you'd have been a farmer. You would have been, for want of a better term, in servitude to the seasons. You would have had to have sowed your seed, plowed the land, harvested at set times. Now, today, that still broadly applies in agriculture, although now we have irrigation. Now we have fertilizers. We can plant seeds in places where Mother Earth would not have allowed us to plant seeds 300 years ago. And also, most of us don't work in agriculture. We work in jobs that are not seasonally dependent. Technology has shifted our thinking such that We've come to think that we're really in control. And this is one reason, I think, when, when something like COVID bursts through where we don't have immediate control, we have no way of handling it. We go into a complete overdrive panic and scramble to regain control. So technology has, has shaped the way we think about control. Technology shaped the way we think about our bodies. 
Think about that statement, I'm a woman trapped in a man's body. Why did the doctor 100 years ago necessarily respond to that by saying, that's a problem with the mind. We need to bring the mind into line with the body. Because it was thoroughly implausible to give any other answer. The body's fixed. The body's sex is fixed. Now, of course, technology has trained us to think, well, our bodies are actually just stuff. Our bodies are really like the rest of the universe, just pieces of Play-Doh over which we can exert our power and our will. Technology has made that plausible. Technology has also transformed the nature of authority. Think about the traditional authorities that shape the sense of self down to fairly recent times. Uh, the family, religious institutions, the church, the nation, all three of them have certainly undergone internal crises through corruption. We now know that not all families are great. There are abusive parents out there. The church across the spectrum has been exposed as being somewhat less than it claims to be or aspires to be. Nations, the history of nations is not quite as lily white and pure as patriots like to believe. So there have been internal issues, but think about how technology has transformed these institutions as well. Think about the nation. National identities are being eroded, are being eroded by immigration, but also eroded by our ability to see events in other countries with tremendous immediacy. I was struck in the summer of 2020, watching the television uh, and seeing protests and riots in my home country, in England, relative to the George Floyd uh, incident in the United States. At the same time, there were democracy protests in Hong Kong, and there was a crackdown in Hong Kong. Hong Kong was a British colony until 1997, within, easily within my adulthood. Hong Kong was a British colony. I didn't see any major protests about what was going on in Hong Kong in my home country. Somehow, the events in Minneapolis had gripped the imagination of the British people in a way that their own national history did not do so. Why? Internet, technology gives an immediacy to these things. The nation is crumbling. We might also add that the nation is in crisis because of expressive individualism. What does expressive individualism ultimately butt up against? Anything that makes demands upon the individual. The sacrifice of the self for something greater is increasingly implausible to the expressive individual mind. Church has undergone similar uh, transformation relative to technology. I talked about our ability now to choose our church because we can drive to them or even log on to their web pages. Well, that crushes church authority. Nobody's getting excommunicated anymore, not with any effect. Because you can just leave that church and go to another one because technology has facilitated that. The family. Uh, I, I feel sad now when I talk to parents who seem to think that because they homeschool their kids or send them to Christian school that they are somehow keeping them safe from the world around. The most authoritative things in a child's life are smartphones. YouTube and TikTok have far more authority than parents and teachers in young children's lives today. The internet is subverting parental authority. So we have that aspect. Those old things that would form our identity are being shattered or weakened in dramatic ways that make, of course, the expressive individual even stronger, even stronger. We can also add to this uh, another technological uh, dimension, and that of what's called social acceleration. If you were to go back to the 16th century, you could write the history of the Reformation, which was my own scholarly field. You could write the history of the Reformation in terms of it's a realignment of European power structures in the light of a new technological invention. The printing press changes everything. 
the printing press transforms the power structures in Europe in the 16th and 17th centuries. And you have 150 years of bloody conflict before Europe stabilizes, we might say, around the printing press. One technological innovation traumatizes society for that period of time. We live in an era now where the tech the technological innovations are coming so fast that we cannot begin to assimilate the impact of one before another one rolls into town. If you like, we're, we've only just got wet with one wave before another wave crashes on top of us. This creates what sociologists call a feeling of social acceleration, that everything is constantly running away from us. There's nothing stable to ground ourselves in. In other words, that idea that the world has a meaning gets less and less plausible, and the idea that the world is just stuff to be subject to technological ma manipulation becomes stronger and stronger. And external markers for identity become fluid and unstable. And that really places huge responsibility on us. The responsibility for our identity becomes an act of our will. Why is this taken on a distinctive sexual shape in our current climate? Well, I think for one reason, one reason is once Freud sexualized that inner space, sexual politics was the inevitable result. I would also add to that that sexual desire is one of the most powerful things that human beings experience. It's an easy sell to us that our sexual desires are who we are, especially in a time when there's nothing else around us that gives us a good and solid grip on who we might be. Uh, when you think of the Middle Ages, it was easy to know who you were. You belonged to this family. You lived in that place. You pursued that calling that your father and your grandfather and your great-grandfather had pursued before you. You tilled that plot of land. You were baptized, married, and you would be buried in that church. None of that applies anymore. A culture of expressive individualism in a world of such dramatic flux as ours I think is always likely to tilt in a sexual direction because sexual desire is a powerful constant within human experience. Political iconoclasm today focuses on overthrowing traditional sexual mores as an act of liberation. The entertainment industry sells sex as the means of self-fulfillment. That's only intensified in internet Pornography. As I mentioned before, the nature of the sexual revolution is not a broadening of the sexual canon. It is the moving of sexual desire and sexual expression to the very center of what it means to be a human being. We might now look at, well, how does this play out on, say, what remains of our institutions, how we think about history? Well, I would say one of the things that we see in our institutions today is that institutions have been transformed from places of formation to platforms of performance, as the political scientist Yuval Levine has argued uh, in a recent book. Uh, when I was at school, I remember walking home from school one day and I was wearing a blazer and a tie. I went to a, what you would call a public school. It was a state-run school, but you had to pass a test to get in. It was a very traditional boys' school. I was walking home with a blazer and tie on, top button done up, everything, shirt untucked. The second master, the British equivalent of the vice principal, called me out for bringing the name of the school into public disrepute. That's unimaginable today. But he did that, of course, because I was not an individual. When I'm wearing the school uniform, I was a representative of something bigger than myself. Today, it's fascinating going to American graduations that everybody decorates their mortarboards. Graduations are not a move whereby one becomes part of something bigger than oneself. They're platforms for expressing one's 
individuality. I saw a debate on the news recently about school district trying to reintroduce school uniforms and the parents complaining. And one of the lines was, why can't we just let the kids express themselves through the way they dress? It's emblematic of an institution that has moved from formation to performance. And of course, technology, again, supercharges that. What are TikTok, Facebook, Instagram? They're not places of formation. They are the most powerful institutions in our children's lives, but they're not places of formation. They're platforms of performance. We might add, uh, think about this as well in terms of the past. What happens to the past? Well, if the individual is a matter of inner feelings and desires, then everything that imposes upon those things becomes oppressive. Historical narratives that don't affirm me become narratives of oppression. History becomes a nightmare. History becomes something that presses down on me and prevents me from being myself. When that explodes in the public square in dramatic forms, it becomes you know, a need for a dramatic forgetting, a removal of those signs and symbols of an allegedly oppressive past, whether it's Abraham Lincoln or Christopher Columbus. It's not enough to simply offer a critique of such symbols. They have to be removed because their very existence is a witness against my own self-identity. History, if you like, pivots to the victim. When expressive individualism emerges as a force, as when it emerges as a normative self, history pivots to the victim. History becomes not something that forms us, but something that denies us, that oppresses us, that refuses to acknowledge us. It's why so-called dead naming is so offensive to trans people. Why? To dead name somebody is to remind them that they have a history, a history that they see as contradicting who they really are. It's why traditional freedoms, speech and religion are now under huge pressure. Think of uh, Thomas Jefferson's statement in his, I think it's in his notes on the states of Virginia, when he talks about, you know, what does it matter to me if my neighbor believes in one God or 20 gods or no God at all? It neither picks my pocket nor breaks my legs. One of my favorite Jefferson statements. When you think about that, what Jefferson's saying there is Jefferson has an understanding of his self that is really rooted in, we might say, physical well-being and the ownership of property. That's how Jefferson thinks of himself. And if you're not hurting his body or you're not stealing his property, he doesn't care what you do. You can believe in as many gods as you want. It doesn't affect his sense of identity. That's the logic of freedom of speech and freedom of religion as being virtues because they don't impinge upon the self. Once the self pivots inward, once expressive individualism emerges as the dominant way of thinking about themselves, Jefferson's statement makes no sense anymore. Words are violence. Words are oppressive because to use a word about me that denies my identity is hurtful. And we all know there's a certain amount of truth in that. I remember at school getting into scrapes and playing sport and coming home bruised. Uh, but I don't remember any particular kick or punch or anything like that. I do remember kids using cruel names about me at points, verbally bullying me. So we know, we know that words have power. In a world of expressive individualism, they have nuclear power. And that's why the most powerful and contested political debates of our day tend to focus on linguistics. Well, that's a fairly broad brushstroke uh, reflection on our problems. Uh, what's the solution? Well, the answer, I'm afraid, is not easy. A uh, couple of things. If the problem we face is multiform in its origins, then no silver bullet's going to solve it in the present. Uh, if 
the problem we face is one, and, and underlying what I've been saying tonight really is this, if the problem we face is really one of the imagination, the way we imagine the world to be, then no argument is going to solve the problem. I think the challenge for religious communities, the challenge for the church, the challenge for Christians is that we need in the coming generation to be a community that's certainly connected to the world. We're still going to have mortgages, student loans, et cetera, et cetera. But a community that is able to be so strong that it fosters and informs the way that Christians imagine the world to be that will allow them to resist the enticements and the plausibilities of the world around us. What that looks like, I don't know. It may look different in different circumstances. But I leave you with this thought. I think it looks local. I don't think it looks national. Not yet, anyway. I think Christianity has been so rapidly disemboweled and so rapidly shunted to the margins of Western society that the hope for a national transformation has to be very small at this point. The place where we can work against this most effectively is in our families, in our churches, and our local communities. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Truman, for that uh, wonderful analysis of, of where we are today, uh, especially in this uh, area of identity. Uh, those of you who are, are watching, uh, feel free to use the Q&A button to uh, text in uh, questions that you may have uh, for us, and we'll do our best to uh, get to as many questions as we can this <clears throat> evening. Uh, perhaps if I can, might, might start with, with this uh, question, Dr. Chairman, we've talked about uh, this idea of, of, of uh, the identity, uh, expressive individualism, that identity, uh, looking through Rousseau and Freud and the politicizing of identity and, and sexuality as being uh, who we are. Uh, could you uh, maybe uh, uh, contrast <clears throat> what you would view as a biblical view of identity, a Judeo-Christian view yeah. of identity that might help us at least in, in uh, setting the framework for where, where society sees we are today and perhaps where the church uh, should see us? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, and I think that I think the West makes a fundamental misstep when, for want of a better way of putting it, it takes seriously Rousseau's rather incoherent statement that man is born free and everywhere is in chains. I say to students in class, just because a statement is self-evidently incoherent nonsense doesn't mean that people won't believe it and attempt to build whole societies upon it. And that is exhibit A. Man is not born free. Of all creatures on the face of the earth, man is born remarkably dependent upon others. My wife and I have the great pleasure and delight of looking forward to the arrival of our first grandchild uh, next March. And uh, I am pretty confident that when she is born, she will be utterly dependent upon her mother and father for her survival. If my son and my daughter-in-law go and leave her in the woods somewhere for a few days after birth uh, and go back to fetch her, she will be dead. Man is not defined by freedom as much as we might like to think that. Man is not defined by autonomy. Man is defined by relationships of dependency and obligation. And so I would say one of the things we need to, we need to start with when we're thinking really you know, about building an anthropology, we have to start by, first of all, rejecting the premise that we are independent, autonomous individuals. We have to see ourselves first and foremost as those who have dependencies upon and responsibilities towards others. Now, as a Christian, I would ground that in biblical teaching. I think that is very clearly the teaching of the creation narrative, that man is created in the image of God, and God gives man obligations towards the world around. And interestingly enough, Adam is incomplete until Eve appears on the scene. It's, uh, I, I, when I teach uh, the Western Civ course at Grove City College, we start with creation, and I, I, I quote some bits from Milton's Paradise Lost, and I make the point that I think one of the things Milton's getting at in his 
beautiful poetic account of the first time that Adam sees Eve is this, that Adam isn't really Adam until he sees Eve. It's only when he has this creature that is flesh of his flesh and bone of his bone, towards whom he has responsibilities and upon whom he is dependent, that he becomes truly Adam, truly human. So I would say a Christian anthropology needs to start by denying the basic premise of Western anthropology, that we are independent, free human beings, and build an anthropology based upon dependency and obligation. And that's not a particularly political point, because that smacks against radical American right-wing individualism as much as it does against the sort of the, the left-wing libertarianism that's, that's becoming so sort of troublesome at the moment. I think what we need is an anthropology of dependency and responsibility. Thank you. That's, that, that's helpful. Uh, I suppose another question would be this. If we think about this expressive individualism and think about a person who is identifying <clears throat> themselves uh, by their sexuality and uh, their inner feelings, what would be, you say, is the, could be the long-term consequences for anyone who defines himself in that way? What, and maybe what are some of the ramifications or things that we're beginning to see in our society that as a result of people uh, viewing themselves in this way. Yeah, it, it, it's, it, it's interesting and disturbing. And, and first of all, I would want to preface this by saying, uh, and I tried to sort of hint at this in the lecture, I think if we, if we identify ourselves as straight, we're as much a part of the problem as anybody else. And I, I would counsel uh, any Christian uh, in discussions with friends who may be same-sex attracted or something like that, don't call yourself straight because you're immediately conceding the identity ground there. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to be consistent in how we talk about ourselves as we engage with others. I think one of the some of the consequences we're seeing uh, uh, in the world around us are really the denial of responsibility towards others and the rise of a morality that prioritizes, I would say, selfishness. Mm. It's interesting when you get these accounts of sports stars who come out as, as gay and leave their wives and take up with you know, a gay lover of some kind. You never hear very much about the wife and kids left behind. Usually the person is lionized because of the, the courage they've had to be themselves or some version of that kind of theme. So if that's a, a bellwether of what's to come, I think what we'll see is that the, the, the sexual identity issue could become the issue by which selfishness and radical individualism is sanctified and exalted above all responsibilities and dependencies. And I'm not sure that society can survive on that basis. Mm. I, I think if you know, Freud is correct, that if everybody just goes around satisfying every sexual urge they have, we end up with anarchy and chaos. Mm. If we don't have some kind of sexual restraint, sexual code, if we don't have some way of shaming people who behave in sexually incontinent ways, then we are doomed as a society. Mm. No society can survive without a framework of sexual morality to protect the family, to protect individuals, and to define responsibilities and obligations. Mm. What do you think? Uh, I think you mentioned earlier that uh, as regards sexual mores and finding ways <clears throat> to uh, define what's appropriate or inappropriate behavior that uh, in the current uh, secular uh, notion, uh, there's this idea of consent. As long as sex is consensual, yeah. uh, then everything is, uh, is all right. What do you see what might be the flaws with that notion in, in the sense of in us discussing that, say, with a friend and, and just showing the logical uh, yeah. consequences of that? Well, I, I think uh, one of the obvious flaws in it is consent is a very, very difficult issue to established, particularly at law. And I think one of the good things that the hashtag Me Too movement has, has really brought to, to our attention is the fact that you know, consent's complicated. What does it mean when a young girl who's desperate to get into movies consents to allowing a, a Hollywood mogul to 
uh, engage in a sexual activity with her, even if she says yes, is that consent? And I think most of us would say, no, that that's not consent. That the the power differential there is such that that's not really consent. So I think first of all, there's a terrible problem with the establishment of what is and is not consensual. Mm. Secondly, I think we need to realize that adult sexual behavior damages children. Mm. Uh, uh, When a husband dumps his wife for a younger model, uh, he damages his children. Mm. And and I think we, we want to say in that situation, it's not enough that the woman he's had sex with agreed to have sex with him, she's not the only person, she's not the only interested party in that sexual activity. Sexual activity is such that there are more interested parties than those directly involved in the acts themselves. Thirdly, I'd want to say the issue of consent is not absolute at law anyway. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm I'm not saying here that you know, pedophilia is going to be legalized necessarily. But if the only thing stopping pedophilia being legalized is the fact that children can't consent to sexual activity with adults, well, the bad news is that adults make kids do things they don't want to do all the time. They make them go to ch- uh, school. They make them do their homework. They make them eat their greens. Now, these may be relatively trivial examples, but the point is... Children are made to do things they don't consent to. They, they have vaccinations they don't consent to. So if you think you can build a solid case against pedophilia simply on the grounds that children can't consent, that's not a strong case. You've got to do better than that. Mm. So I think those three reasons, the complexity of defining and establishing consent, the fact that sex has implications far beyond the people actually involved in the sexual act. And thirdly, that consent is not actually absolute at law anyway. Hmm. Those three things indicate that a sexual morality built on consent, it's about as strong as a spider web. (laughs) It's not going to hold. Yes. No, thank you for that. So so if we think about then the ramifications of this uh, selfishness, uh, expressive individualism, uh, people thinking only about themselves. There is a lot of collateral damage that, that can occur in families, in institutions, in society. Uh, and I, so a question would be this, how, how can we as followers of Jesus Christ present a, an image uh, of, of something better? Uh, I think you, you hinted at this yeah. idea of community. Maybe could you uh, maybe um, tell us a little bit more what that looks like and that we could begin to attract people and sense over to our perspective or our side as they begin to see the, the, the blessings that come uh, from doing things uh, uh, Jesus's way. Yeah, I, 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 as I said in the lecture, I think this could look different in, in different places. But I mean, take marriage, for example. What's the best argument for traditional marriage? The best argument for traditional marriage is good traditional marriages where the husband and wife have been faithful for many years, where they brought up children, where they've been through the thick and the thin together. You know, how am I going to persuade my students at Grove that traditional marriage is the best option? I'm going to have them around at my house. I want them to see the way I interact with my wife. I want them to come into my house and in a way be sort of for just a brief time, be part of the family. So that we can present them with something that it's not perfect, but is realistic and something that they might go away and say, yes, I, I, I want something like that in my life. That, I think, requires individual Christians and the church to take marriage seriously. Uh, I, I think we all, you know, there's a, there's a darker side to this that we need, for example, to, uh, to treat no-fault divorce as seriously as we treat gay marriage. Uh, I have every sympathy in the world with a gay couple who say, how dare you object to my marriage when you allow all these people with no fault divorces to be part of your church and nobody bats an eyelid. I think we need, you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's tough stuff we have to do. But I think the best way of presenting human flourishing in the broader sense is to present people with humans flourishing. And also, I think, to teach on it. I, I raise the question in class. 
I talk to the students a lot about, about love. And I say, you know, it's easy to love your wife or your husband on your wedding day. What about 50 years later when the one partner or the other perhaps has Alzheimer's disease and is totally dependent upon the individual, the other, the other spouse to feed them and maybe take care of their most basic bodily needs? And I ask the students, you know, in one sense, that's not beautiful outwardly. But do you think, but is it, is there a beauty and a depth there? And yeah, I, I get them to think about things like that. And it's one of the reasons why I'm a big believer in churches where there's a spread of ages. So I think it's important that young people see old people who aren't cool and good looking anymore, loving and caring and being devoted to each other. So I think the best way of promoting the flourishing Christian life is to be a flourishing Christian community. Well, that's a, a great picture. Uh, I think one uh, area that many, many people are, are uh, chiming in about in their questions here have to do really uh, as well with children. Uh, those of us who are parents or grandparents, uh, mm -hmm. we have children growing up in this world that is, as we've mentioned, quite different yeah. from what I experienced growing up and, and you experienced. Uh, there's a, just a change in perspective. How can we talk with our children uh, uh, graciously about what they're they're um, uh, they're dealing with on TikTok and in their schools yeah, and yeah. in society and and help them to navigate uh, this world in, in in a gracious, thoughtful manner as well yeah. as they deal with their friends. It's hard, and I'm very glad that my kids grew up just before smartphones became a thing. Uh, I mean, I would counsel any parent: don't give your kid a smartphone. You know, don't give your child a smartphone. They're going to hate you for that. But you're meant to be a parent, not a friend. Be a parent. Don't give your kid a smartphone. Now, I understand that then, that, okay, so am I not going to let my kids play with kids who own smartphones? I, I think it's impossible to completely immunize our children to the stuff out there. But we can fulfill the responsibilities in the sphere that we have authority over. Uh, secondly, I think where kids are concerned, try to keep the channels of communication open. Uh, keep talking to them. Uh, I'm a big believer, though, in, in trying to model, again, family life. Uh, trying to have sit-down meals with you. No, not that my wife and I did that every night, but we tried on the whole to have dinner around the dining room table. We tried on the whole to be a family in practice and not be dominated by the TV or this, that, or the other. So I think that that also plays a role. Uh, be aware of what's out there. I think don't assume that it's not going to happen to your kid. If they've got a cell phone or they've got a friend with a you know, smartphone or they've got a friend with a smartphone, it can get to them. Uh, I also think be wise as serpents on this front. I mean, one of the big plagues at the moment that's having a huge impact on a lot of young girls is the trans craze. Uh, I would recommend any parent read Abigail Schreier's book, Irreversible Damage. One of the things you learn in that book is how YouTube and TikTok coach kids to manipulate their parents. Uh, the standard play on the trans issue is if you don't allow me to transition, I'll commit suicide. Well, that's the most terrifying thing any parent could ever hear, I think. But if you know it's part of the playbook, you may not take it at face. I mean, uh, you know, don't dismiss it, but you may be less inclined simply to go along with it at face value than you might otherwise have been. So I think educate yourselves about the kind of stuff that your kids are seeing online that's shaping how they're going to approach you as a way of manipulating and subverting your authority. Hmm. Now, thank you for that. Well, uh, maybe as a way to wrap up our evening, uh, we do see uh, uh, so much going on in our culture, and at, at times it seems, it seems as if the world is in crisis and chaos and everything about our world is, is doom, and, and, uh, and yet we know that Jesus Christ is, is the great uh, victor and savior and Lord, and uh, he's at work in this world. Uh, what uh, would you offer as hope uh, to people in, in this yeah, world as we yeah. think about uh, how we can stand for Christ in this world today? 
Well, first of all, I think there are oases of hope out there. I'm actually about to, tomorrow morning, I'm going to be uh, writing uh, an article with uh, a friend, Alexandra de Sanctis, uh, in support of a, a young student at a university who's taken a pretty courageous stand on the LGBTQ issue. Uh, and I think some of the signs of hope come from the young people. In my world, in higher education, to be honest, I'm seeing students being more courageous than professors. Hmm. Uh, and so I'm encouraged by young people. And that's why I want to speak out and I want to support these young people when they take a stand, the kind of stand that I never had to take. So I think we should, we should not damn every young person as being part of the problem. I think there's a rising generation where there are some good, just a small number, but some good and courageous kids mm -hmm. who are taking stands. And I think that should convict those of us who are older that we need to take stands too. So on the one hand, the, the, the rising generation is not entirely lost at all. In some ways, I've got more confidence in them than I have in guys like myself. I'm not seeing many people in their mid-50s doing many courageous things, but I am seeing kids of 21, 22, 23 facing these issues down. So that's encouraging. Secondly, uh, I think, you know, and go to the point you made, there are the promises. Uh, the church is going to win. The gates of hell are not going to prevail. Now, that's not unmitigated good news for everybody. The Bible doesn't say that the American church is going to win, or my own denomination is going to win, or my local church is going to win. Churches come and churches go. Denominations come and denominations go. But the church of Jesus Christ doesn't disappear. The promises are to that church. If Stalin and Hitler were unable to wipe the church off the face of the map, then I don't think the LGBTQ community are going to be doing it anytime soon. We may get a lot smaller. Life may get a lot more uncomfortable for us. But the promise is still good. God is still sovereign. And I think, uh, as, I, as I hinted in the first part of the answer, I think he's raising up courageous young people who are going to carry the fight forward for us. Well, thank you so much, uh, Carl. Really appreciate uh, your uh, taking time with us this evening. Uh, I encourage everyone out there to uh, pick up uh, this book, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self, a wonderful uh, read, and it'll give you much more uh, detail on some of the things we've discussed tonight. Uh, but thank you again, uh, Carl, just for being with us. And God bless you and, and your continued work uh, at Grove City and your writing and, and, and all that you do. Uh, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Yes. And for all of you who've joined us this evening, we're so grateful to have you with us tonight. Uh, the C.S. Lewis Institute is a, a ministry that uh, uh, seeks to help develop disciples of Jesus Christ who will be able to articulate and defend and share and live their faith in this very difficult, rough and tumble world. And we believe that Jesus Christ can equip you to do just that. Uh, we uh, uh, hope that you'll take advantage again of the resources of the C.S. Lewis Institute. Check out our website and our social media posts. And as well, um, this event and others like it are, are uh, made possible by the uh, generous donations of people around the country. And so we'd like to ask you to consider uh, making a gift tonight uh, to further this discipleship ministry. There will be some information on the screen in a little bit giving you uh, uh, ways that you could give this evening. Thank you again for joining us and may God bless you.